every year I invite Sanjay Parikh, my very, very good friend and uh, former colleague from the University of Washington. He is a professor of otolaryngology at Seattle Children's Hospital and just really a, a fun guy to hang out with. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just an amazing moderator. And he always, uh, he always tries to, tar he always does target these, these, these tough questions and uh, often at my expense. Uh, that's okay, I don't mind getting humbled all the time. But um, Sanjay, thank you for doing this. We have uh, Amy Onstead, Doug Gray, David Pecker, and myself at your disposal. Well, uh, wow, thank you for that uh, kind introduction. I've always aspired to be known as the moderator of excellence, so that was you, you, that was very nice. Uh, also, uh, thanks uh, for the invitation to speak, and uh, thanks to Lee, our AV person. I I was with him earlier this morning, making sure that this was all going to work out fine. And it looks like it's going to go great. I, I have to say, I, I don't think I've ever given uh, a panel virtually, so this is kind of a fun first. Let's see how it goes. It may go well, it may not, uh, and uh, we'll find out at the end. Uh, for those of you, uh, Greg, they, I, I have no disclosures, and uh, th this is Seattle on a nice uh, sunny day with a uh, with a nice uh, cruise ship there, um, and uh, so it does. It is sunny here some days, and uh, and then here's uh, my hospital here. Where uh, uh, I don't know. Can you? Does the pointer show up on the screen there? I don't know. Does the pointer yes, show does. up? It does. Okay, cool. Is so that this a is our green? new okay. wing here, or and then we park. just. Uh, to, oh, you can? You can see my... Uh, oh, we can see the pointer. I'm pointer. just curious, what's the green grass? Is that a putting green? Practice green for you guys? Oh, or? Yeah. That's, a, this is a, that's actually a family donated that as an outdoor space. Right next to that is our oncology uh, center there so that uh, our inpatients that are there, sort of the cancer patients can go out and get some fresh air. So it's actually kind of a cool thing. And then uh, my, my building, I'm sitting over here right now. This is where I'm sitting over here right now. And, um, and it, you know, it's, it's a nice, uh, nice building. Okay, so here's our esteemed uh, panelists. Um, and I'll just uh, go through uh, each one. And um, uh, first we have Dr. Amy Onstead, who uh, graduated from UIC in Chicago and then uh, did her fellowship at the University of Miami and then joined uh, us locally here in Seattle. Uh, Dr. Greg Davis who has uh, trained at the University of Washington, uh, also as an MPH, and then did his fellowship in Australia. Dr. David, uh, and, and, and David, how do I pronounce your last name? Is it? Petker. What do you prefer? Petker. As if Dr. there's David no Petker. O. Yeah, Petker. Yeah. Petker, great. Nice to meet you, David. Um, he is a graduate of Medical College of Wisconsin, then did his fellowship in Portland at uh, OHSU and is now the chief of rhinology and associate professor at MCW. Full professor. And then now uh, we, you pardon me? Yeah, technically I'm a full professor, not, a, not an associate. Oh, I, I, I correct, uh, excellent, full That's professor. Okay. That you just you just got promoted today. Congratulations, that's great. Um, Doug promoted. And then, uh, <laughs> and then I, I'm sorry. I've just, I just gathered stuff from the internet, so I apologize. It's not up to date. And then we have Dr. Ray, uh, uh, Doug uh, from uh, the Baltimore region, who did uh, residency at OHSU and uh, fellowship at Mass Sinear. So we have quite an esteemed panel of uh, experts in rhinology. And uh, as uh, what I'd like to suggest we do is we make this kind of a fun um, sort of a interactive session of some challenges in rhinology. So I'm going to ask you to sit with your teammate. Uh, I can't see. Maybe you're already sitting with your teammate. We're going to have two teams here. Uh, Dr. Anstead, Dr. Petker will be one team. And, uh, and uh, Dr. Davis and Dr. Ray will be another team. And this is what we will call rhinomania. It will be a competition. And uh, the, I'm going to tell you about the rules in a second. Uh, first of all, we have to name you. One is uh, so, so the group from Seattle and Milwaukee, I think that Team Saki seems like a good kind of name. So they will have one <laughs> one team, Saki, and then the Seattle, Baltimore, I think, uh, Saltimore. So it'll be Saki uh, versus Saltimore. And uh, here are the rules. Um, you, you'll, you'll, you'll receive points based on your performance. So, uh, and, and, and I'm, there's only one perform. judge, that's me. And so I will be uh, awarding points based on, on how you, you do. Um, now, evidence, evidence is permitted, but it's not mandatory. So, you know, it, this is a rhinology panel, after all. So, you know, you will have some evidence, but mostly not. And so it's not mandatory. Um, you, you, you may interrupt each other. Actually, I encourage that. That actually makes it 
um, more fun. So it's okay to interrupt each other. And then I may make up rules as we go along, just as sort of that's another rule. All right. So let's move on to the first uh, case here. Um, and it's a uh, yeah, sort of four. Uh, and, and by the way, these are not uh, designed to be tricky cases, but more cases that sort of um, highlight some of the challenges that we're all uh, dealing with daily in our practice. Uh, um, and, and so this is a 40 year old healthy, uh, let's say female with uh, chronic rhinus sinusitis without polyposis, meets our national guidelines of 90 days of significant symptomology of at least two symptoms, uh, in this case, nasal obstruction and rhinorrhea. Um, and, and I want to I want to ask the group and, and and you know we hear this term now you know we're moving away from maxical medical therapy to the term of comprehensive medical therapy. There's other terms too as well, but I'd like to hear what 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 is state of the art for for when you see a patient like this uh, and you, before you feel they've not been fully treated. What what are you doing? And, and we'll start with Team Saki. So you guys can uh, you know uh, Dr. Anstead and and uh, Petker. What do you guys think? So you want to know like full workup for a 40-year-old with the CRS? Sure. No, not necessarily workup, but what you, how would you, it may be a small facet of, of that. Just like, therapy. Of medical okay. therapy. So I think, I think the first thing to start with is just topical steroids. Um, and so the, the question is, how do you get them in there? And, and so, and I think probably each patient is different with what they're willing to do, but budesonide irrigations is um, obviously the powerhouse in uh, medical therapy for rhinology. So we'd start with that. Um, you know, we'd do a scope and uh, look and see if there's anything to culture. You could do a, a long course of culture-directed antibiotic therapy. Um, and then uh, a course of oral steroids. And then she would need an allergy workup. Uh, okay, so you're, you're, you're promoting allergy workup as routine along with topical budesonide possibly antibiotics and um, and maybe oral steroids. Is that, is, that, is that what you're thinking? Correct. Do you have something to add? Okay. Let's go to team. Uh, so maybe, or did uh, David, you want to chime something else in? No, I, I agree. I think the topical steroids, like Amy said, is crucial. Um, how you get them in there, another great point. Um, depends on what they have been on. That will uh, guide me as to where I start. Try to start as easiest, uh, the easiest thing and the cheapest thing first. Um, so if they, she's never been on a uh, fluticasone, then I'll start her on fluticasone. If, uh, if she's never, if she's been on fluticasone and either can't do it, can't tolerate it, or it doesn't work, then bump her up to uh, a budesonide wash. So I think that that's a great thing, and I think it works really well. Okay, let's go to Saltimore. Saltimore has uh, maybe a couple different opinions. Um, but I agree with the nasal steroid spray, starting with that. There's a couple different conflicting factors, though. We have what do we think actually works best medically? What do the payers require us sometimes to do medically, which is vastly different? And then what do the international consensus guideline statements say for CRS without nasal polyps, where antibiotics are just considered an option and steroids are not? Steroids are also an option. Um, my approach is treating these patients kind of how I would want to try to avoid a surgery with medicine, and that's going to be three weeks with antibiotics and uh, a 12-day prednisone taper along with topical steroids. What if body. there's no pus? Do you still give them three weeks of antibiotics? So you still, yeah, that's the problem. Yeah. That, that and is then exactly when they come it. back so, with C. diff, what, uh, then what do you tell them? Yeah. I love this interruption, by the way. Good job. That's a point for you. Thank nice. you. <laughs> yeah. Nice work, partner. Nice work. Yeah. Okay. So if you don't give antibiotics, get him, get him. you have a high risk of getting a denial for surgery if, you, if the patient ends up needing surgery. Um, if you don't see purulence on endoscopy, that definitely does not mean they don't have purulence in the sinuses, right? We need the CT scan to identify as their frothy material, such as purulence in the sinuses. Just because they're not draining pus at this time doesn't mean they don't have a true infection. So again, if, if it were me, my family member wanting to avoid surgery, I'd do three weeks of antibiotics, 12 days of prednisone taper, nasal steroid sprays, and sinus saline irrigations. I mean, this Dr. Ray. I'm sorry. Can I can I just clarify one thing? No. So first visit, you would give all of those things at once. I would. Yeah. Why not? First first time you meet them, not been on anything else, and you're giving them. It three depends weeks on the severity of the disease. But if she has 
opacified sinuses. How do you know she has opacified sinuses? Well, it again, it said it depends on the severity of the disease. Let, let's so let's assume this patient is needing national guidelines for CRS. And I've already described two symptoms, chronic congestion and chronic rhinorrhea. And let's say it's been yellow-green, just to make it a little more clear for the group here. I, I think let's just imagine this patient is someone who's already been seeing someone else and has come to you for an additional opinion after being treated outside. Okay, then yes, I would agree with that. I'm assuming we have a CT scan that shows true CRS, that we're not just guessing no. it's a CRS based no. on symptoms, which this is not is a proper way to diagnose symptoms. CRS. Yeah, I don't think if, if a patient comes in with pan sinus opacification or significant disease, putting them on nasal steroids is enough. The only thing I disagreed um, with Greg is uh, the duration of oral steroids I, I, or um, antibiotics. I, I also do a 12-day steroid taper, but I'd put them on a little shorter dose of antibiotics. Uh, how, how short? Uh, 10 days. So if they don't have a scan, would you get a scan before you treat them, or do you treat them and then you get a scan? 100% I get a scan. And you haven't had any issues with insurance? At, at what time do you get hey, a scan? Let me just interrupt for a sec. So Sanjay can't hear the audience. So if we can, instead of just answering, repeat the question. So we have a, and real quick, there's microphones on all the tables right in front of you. That little black thing is a microphone. Oh, man, this place is so high tech. So just push the button if you want to interrupt. You get bonus points for interrupting us, by the way. So Yeah, the audience the audience can win, too, by the way. Just to <laughs> yeah, the audience will win, I think. That's one point for the audience so far, I think. Um, I mean, I, I think you have to make the diagnosis, and you need objective evidence to make the diagnosis. The diagnosis is no longer made with subjective symptoms because we know we used to overdiagnose CRS. They have to have endoscopic evidence, pus, inflammation polyps, or CT evidence of mucosal thickening to make the uh, I'm going to I'm going to interrupt you. Too. I want to hear Team Team Saki's opinion about that to make the diagnosis. Do you agree with Dr. Davis there, Dr. Petker, Dr. Anstead? What do you think for your hands to make a diagnosis of CRS? Yes, I think you need objective evidence. I, I agree with that statement. And what are your what are your measures for that? Do you same as Greg, or do you have others? So I would say, yeah, pus uh, on exam, polyps on exam, or um, uh, a CT scan that uh, that shows mucosal thickening, uh, air fluid levels, frothy secretions, that type of thing. So yes, I agree with that. But without the CT scan, then that's why I go back to the uh, the easiest, cheapest things first: topical steroids, and work your way up through the algorithm. And I, I don't. I wouldn't say that I would get a CT scan um, necessarily right off the bat. Um, so if somebody came came in, and this this never happens, but if somebody came into me and they've never had a CT scan before and they've never seen a rhinologist before, um, and I was the first person they would see and I scoped them and they had polyps and I knew they had chronic sinus disease, I'd treat them and then have them come back and then they get a CT scan. Um, so I can see what they look like when they're their best. So I want to see, after maximum medical management, how good can you look? Okay, let's, let's ask Team Saltimore about that. Is there any real uh, benefit from waiting uh, than trying to time sinusitis, uh, time uh, imaging around symptomology? Do you think that there's any value to that? It depends on what you're looking at. If you're looking at recurrent sinusitis, then, yeah, it depends. Um, I disagree um, with Amy a little bit in the sense that I always want to get a CT when they're at their worst, not when they're at their best. And why? Because if they're doing great, then you're not going to do anything. If a pay so w what's our measure of outcome here? Our measure of outcome is their quality of life. So if they come into our office and they feel great, they're like, I can breathe, I can smell, I can taste, I can sleep, I'm going to work. Why are you going to get a CAT scan? You, you've won. I, w I wouldn't get a CAT scan in that case. So if I maximum medical gave you the maximum medical management and I said, okay, you know, I'm going to give you this medication and I, you're going to feel better. You should feel better. Um, and then and then you're going to follow up with me because in my mind, I'm and the only reason I would have them follow up with me is if in my mind I was thinking they're going to need eventually surgery. Like it's bad enough, but right. I have to prove that they're going to fail. Okay, so then you get your CAT scan and it looks actually pretty good and then they feel crappy again. I still do surgery on them. Would you get another CAT scan? No. How do you know which sinuses to open up? How, how, how do you know the extent of your surgery? So Let's say it's just anterior disease, maxillary and anterior ethmoids. 
So it would actually probably depend on what I find on physical exam and also what I find during surgery. But I don't think this, the CT scan wouldn't stop me. So if I went into surgery and they have polyps everywhere, but the CT scan only showed polyps in the maxillary sinuses, it wouldn't stop me from doing a complete surgery. So I think this is a really great kind of discussion because I, I'm challenged when I take care of mostly kids and, you know, we try and avoid scans altogether in kids, right? So our guidelines are no imaging until starting to think about surgery. And I'm and, often challenged with the same I, scenario. I think when, like, how do I time that yeah. relative surgery? Because am I making the wrong decisions based on under finding? Dr. Pecker, what do you think? Is there, is, do we have any evidence to support timing it around the symptomology? Uh, so there isn't a lot of evidence um, one way or the other. I personally like to get them uh, get the CT scans when they're at their worst, uh, mostly because I see a lot of patients who have all the check boxes as far as the symptoms are concerned, and then you get a CT scan and the sinuses look great. And so um, without without I never get that patient with uh, <laughs> see I see it a lot and, and, and so I send a ton of patients to neurology for uh, for that and so um, you know again it's just all about your your, your practice, practice patterns yeah. and and so I see a lot of that so I don't like to treat them and get a CT scan because I think that the treatment biases the exam results and so it's much easier to explain to a patient and get them to believe you that, uh, that they don't truly have sinus disease if they were feeling poorly, no medication on board, and their CT scan still looked good. Um, if it looked bad, that gives me an idea of the extent of surgery, what to do, and whether or not surgery is a, is a viable option. Um, but again, it's all about your practice patterns, and, uh, and so, um, uh, that's that's usually how I will approach them. I had another point, but now I can't remember it. I, I say at the same time. That's great. That oh, you, you, just, I, you, you actually get a point for, for getting your point. You get an extra point. Okay. <laughs> what were you going to say? At the same time that I think I, I – actually, I, I don't think I've ever seen in the past – it's probably been almost a decade since I've seen somebody that hasn't had a CT scan before they present to my office. Yeah. So they've already had a CT scan. They've already it's already been established that they have sinus disease. That's the only way they make it into my clinic. Oh, that would be so great. Let's uh, <laughs> let's try and uh, yeah. You guys have done a nice job here. This is great. We only have had one question, and uh, you know it's going really well. Thank you. Um, the next uh, thing is about. It sounds. I mean, I think we've already covered this. It looks like all of you are really in favor of topical steroids, and you may use different del delivery devices based on what you're finding. Is that accurate? Are you guys using one standard delivery device, or for your for your steroids, or is it is it based on someone trying? I heard someone said, "Oh, it depends on what I've tried before." Or do we have it? There's some evidence. So let me let's start with Team Salt um, Salt Saltimore. What do you guys think? Is there an ideal device for devi delivering topical steroids? Well, there are d different devices out there, um, and I think what we know, especially in patients that have had surgery, is that you want something that's going to deliver the steroids up into the sinuses where the polyps or the disease is. So you want to get up into the ethmoids, the skull base, you want good penetration. Um, so you want some type of high flow. I think if you look at the studies that have looked at deposition for traditional over-the-counter nasal steroids, they don't get up far enough to treat the chronic sinusitis. They work great for allergies where the disease is anterior and medial and in the front of the nose. Um, but there's different systems out there. So steroid irrigations were kind of our mainstay for a while, but now Xhance has come onto the market and that's, um, that's a similar system in the sense that the steroid is delivered uh, sort of deeper up into the, into the sinuses. And that's an exhaled delivery system or um, EDS. Greg, anything to add? Yeah. So I, if a patient has not had sinus surgery, the deposition of sinus irrigations does not penetrate significantly into the sinuses. So I find no reason to um, incur the patient's additional cost to add bedesonide to their irrigations. Um, if they've had sinus surgery, absolutely bedesonide irrigations are the way to go. But otherwise, I'll start with the cheaper version of fluticasone, and then if... Um, you know, the patient, for whatever reason, chooses not to. Xhance is an option, but it's not something that I go to very often. Greg, if they fail Ticazone, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, Sanjay. If they fail no, no, Ticazone, yeah. um, will you use budesonide washes in them, even if they have not had surgery? Or Rarely. do you go right from fluticasone to surgery? 
Uh, there's a lot of a lot of unknowns with that question. So if patients have massive inflammatory sinus disease, I have very little faith that Flonase is going to help them to any measurable level. No, but steroid irrigation, so you think they're going to help? Nor do I think steroid irrigations help. I do not think steroid irrigations help in patients who have not had sinus surgery unless they don't have significant sinus inflammation. Their main symptom is post-nasal drainage or just a little bit of rhinorrhea. And sometimes pedestinite irrigations do help those patients. What if they say that they don't want, what if they say they don't want, sorry, what if they say they don't want surgery, but they have real disease? You know, hang on a second. I just want to point out, this is great when your own teammate and you are disagreeing about stuff. You guys get a point just for this. This is great. <laughs> yeah, I don't know if I'm going to invite Doug back next time. <laughs> What's the question? So, <laughs> it was a very, very similar question. A non surgical candidate that has a gross polyps just says, I just want to breathe a little, breathe a little better. The 95 years old comes in the wheelchair with a pacemaker on, you know, just finished having a stroke. So Dr. Green's talking about the 95-year-old stroke patient that I sent to him. <laughs> and, and if he has obvious polyps, what do you do? Awesome patient for Exhans. Truly, that is the patient that I would send uh, up the flagpole for Exhans. Flonase is, probably isn't going to help him. You can try that first because you kind of have to do that for the Exhans uh, pre-authorization process. Have them come back in a month. It's not going to work, and then you have them do enhance. That is a great thing. Uh, I would much, yeah. So I would, I would do enhance over bedesonide in that situation. But you know, has it been your experience that enhance or the the exhalational delivery system? Uh, with fluticasone, which is what Exhance is, just without using the brand name, um, works in that situation because I yes. I would do whatever's cheaper for them, and I don't know the the, the studies with Exhance have compared it to placebo, not to budesonide washes or Flonase or anything else. So I don't know. I truly do not know where to fit it into the treatment algorithm. What about the studies that show budesonide irrigations in non-operated patients? Oh, that's right. There aren't any studies. <laughs> Zero studies on budesonide irrigations in non-operated patients. We only have studies that show sinus irrigations don't penetrate the sinuses. So again, we do have budesonide, we do have exhance in non-operated patients and compared to placebo. I agree. It does help. Yeah. But so does... Right? I mean, that's the problem with Exhance, right? It's like, how do you justify that additional expense when they've only done the, only published the research studies comparing it to placebo? We're all waiting for that pivotal study right. that shows Exhance versus over-the-counter Flonase. And yeah, I agree. Waiting for that one, too. Perfect uh, segue into my uh, last question with this patient, and I'll let uh, Saki start here. Um, you know, uh, what, what do you think, you know, what's on the horizon here, looking to the future? What's the emerging youth therapy that you think has particular promise for this patient? This is a non operate on patient uh, that you've sort of seen personally in the last year that you think is this new therapy is something that has promise, or you've seen some evidence that suggests it's something that's up the, that you think is going to be cool. Uh, you, it, maybe Dr. Anstead or Dr. Pecker, you guys have uh, any thoughts about that? Sorry, I can't hear you. Do you have any thoughts? Because mine, mine are. Well, I think the exhalational delivery system. I think that holds promise. Um, the uh, you know again, the, the hard part is knowing for me how much it costs, and I can get the uh, a topical steroid rinse for thirty three dollars a month, um, and if the exhalational delivery system of fluticasone is more than that, then. Um, then I'll try the the uh, the washes, the budesonide topical wash. So budesonide, you know, we know the vast majority, ninety plus percent pours back out. Whatever you swallow with budesonide, eighty percent of it gets absorbed by the. Uh, excuse me, I should say, hundred percent gets absorbed by the liver and then uh, absorbed by the stomach goes to the liver from the first pass effect, and with budesonide, 80% gets metabolized. A lot of times I will use uh, topical mometasone washes, and 99.9% .9 of that gets metabolized. The one knock on the exhalational delivery system is, is that we know they have a higher systemic absorption of that fluticasone with 
the exhalational delivery system than with, uh, with Flonase or, or traditional fluticasone. So I worry about the steroid absorption with the, uh, with the Exhance. Again, without having data to show that it works or doesn't work, um, and uh, as far as the, the data for the, um, the uh, steroid washes, yeah, that doesn't exist, but it's um, potentially cheaper, and we know anecdotally that it, uh, that it helps quite a bit. I agree with my partner. Nice. Okay. Team Saltimore. Well, this, this, this is without polyps. That's not with this patient. Yeah. Question from the audience. I love it, and and even if it's a placebo, I don't care. They get better, so um, and it's cheap. And so has it been established? <coughs> I just use one respule per um, meal med rinse bottle. The zero point five milligrams yep. per two cc's. That's my standard too. And that's what's been tested from a safety standpoint. So. You, we have some safety data from intraocular pressures and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. So that's a good one to use. Occasionally, though, in polyp patients, if they're recalcitrant and the polyps are coming back, I'll double the dose for a couple months. You can even Alpha put it directly corny. in the nose. So the change is from We're trying to get it back onto CRS without polyps. No, we're not following his rules. <laughs> Yeah, so Dr. Picorni, Sanjay, Dr. Picorni brought up prolonged course of um, the macrolides. Um, I like to refer to the, the meta analysis by Melissa Pinnanen and Geary and myself that showed no increase in efficacy with long term macrolide therapy. Didn't work. Even though there was a randomized trial that showed that it did, but when you actually adjust for everything, long term macrolide therapies in that randomized trial just delayed the time to surgery. As soon as patients came off the macrolides in the randomized trial, the only one that was done, um, true randomized, that Cochrane collaboration uh, reviewed, patients regressed back to their pre macrolide disease state. So. What about uh, what about topical? I haven't heard anyone talk about topical. Maybe I'm missing the questions about topical antibiotics. Is there is there any role these days for topical antibiotics or CRS without polyposis? Without surgery? Without surgery, non-operated on patient. No. 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 That, that wasn't a very fun question, was it? <laughs> All right. Let's uh, let's let's uh, let's move on to. The, I don't, there was too much agreement. We have to move on. Uh, let's start with another. By the way, nice job. I that uh, I don't know. Well, I'm I'm going to keep my scores private, but that was nice. That was nice. Okay. Challenges in rhinology. Next case. Okay, 35 year old with nasal obstruction and uh, isolated turbid hypertrophy, not responsive to systemic or topical therapy. So you look in the nose and there's large inferior terminants. The patient's main only issue is nasal obstruction, not rhinosinusitis, nasal obstruction. You've done allergy testing and it's negative. All right, so you get full complement testing you, and it's a good allergist, you trust the result. Is it time to think about in-office options for this patient? Let's start with Team Saltimore here. What What do you think? One hundred percent, yes. Yeah, bring it on, because you're going to help them out. You know, their chief complaint is nasal obstruction. You've tried topical. I, I would not give systemic corticosteroid therapy for a stuffy nose with turbinate hypertrophy, but I would do topical steroid spray. Um, and okay. if their allergy testing was negative, the next step is in office management. Assuming that now, they're a compliant patient. Let's talk about that for a second. Before, do you need to do anything else diagnostically? Are you ready to go right to a, a, an intervention? So I, these patients, in my opinion, should have... It, if you can see the coena, the nasopharynx on both sides, then great, that's okay. But if not, then these patients should have nasal endoscopy to make sure you're not missing an obstructive lesion posteriorly. Okay, anything else? Do you do any imaging? I'd get a CAT scan. You want to rule out chronic sinusitis. I mean, sometimes they can have 
inflammation. I mean, I, I know that this patient doesn't because you said that, but uh, in order to fully assess the patient, I would always get a CAT scan. I wouldn't get a CAT scan. I wouldn't get a CAT scan. I wouldn't get a CAT scan. Unless we're having other yeah, symptoms. That's... I'm sorry, Dr. Dr. Davies interrupted me. That's a minus point. Dr. Davies. <laughs> I didn't know. Doug, what do you think? So you're telling me anybody that's going to get any intervention for a term in your office gets a CT scan preoperatively. Is that? Is I just that, like to look at the anatomy and see if I'm missing something. I, I, I okay. found weird stuff before. Doctors, let's go to let's go to the Sockies. What do you guys think? One of the comments from the audience is that uh, this could be a random, uh, something random or unusual, like a sarcoid or something like that, or Wagoners or something like that. Um, so I don't do a lot of in-office procedures, and it has to do with my um, hospital and uh, the obscene facility charge that they uh, that they uh, uh, charge the patients. So, um, so I, I want to sit most of this one out. I don't do a lot of in-office procedures. Okay, Dr. Anstead. Actually, I would refer this one to Tracy Erickson, and she would do the procedure. What is and what and what does that mean? And actually, she, I think she would actually do it in the OR too. She doesn't do it in the clinic, and it's a similar reason. It's because our facility fees are super high, so we don't offer a lot of in, you know doing inferior turbinate um, in office uh, procedures. It, it's not cost effective for the patient. So this is a super okay. fun procedure to do on patients in the office, a, a simple turbinate reduction. There's lots of different ways to do it. My favorite way right now is to use a turbinator wand, which is cobalation technology. Um, I inject the turbinate after numbing them up with uh, topical sprays and topical lidocaine, so cotton. Make an incision on the head of the inferior turbinate, elevate it with a caudal elevator, use the cobalation, and I'm done. And these patients, and then usually out fracture it too. These patients get better, and they're going to really appreciate the work you do. And the, is the radio frequency one you're using the needle tip one, or is it a different one? So it's not radio frequency. I I've, I haven't had much success with the RF um, probe that you're talking about. It's the cobalation technology, that kind of plasma energy technology that actually does ablate some of the tissue uh, while it. Uh, and gently cooks it at like 60 Celsius. So I've actually changed um, in the last couple of years since I've been in private practice, um, partly because of my partner, but I, I now use cold steel. I use the Medtronic micro uh, turbinate blade. Um, I think it's a little more effective. And also and I've Dr. noticed just that- to clarify, Dr. Ray, when you say, are you are you shaving bone or are you doing a submucosal reduction? No, it's reduction I'm doing a submucosal resection. I, 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 the, the approach to start with is the exact same that Dr. Davis described. I make a stab incision, I elevate with a caudal, but instead of putting a cobalation wand in, I put the micro reader blade in. I just find that I, I like to avoid, if at all possible, heat in the nose. I mean, sometimes we have to cauterize, but I find that the patients heal up a lot better with a lot less crust and scarring when we don't use heat. And so, um, and I've had a couple patients who are repeat customers who come every couple of years because their turbinates over time grow back. And they've actually said to me, since I use the um, turbinate um, blade, that they see that they get more um, improvement with that. But I, I but it just looking endoscopically at them as they heal, I just find that using not using heat, um, they tend to heal better. There's less crusting, um, scarring. I've not had any issues with bleeding. So I, I have a, had a, two patients bleed with a shaver blade, and that's why I switched to the cobalation. That's, uh, that's really good evidence. I know. Well, it's not an it's not an N of one study. It's an N of two. Um, but talking to some other colleagues, the way to get around that, and, and I may go back. Um, I agree. The blade definitely seems to take more tissue. You got to be careful and not take too much. Um, but if you pack the nose with uh, some Vaseline gauze or Vaseline soaked cotton and just uh, leave a little bit hanging out, the patient can take it out an hour later, and, and that seems to do enough for hemostasis. Do you sew That's, the uh, stab incision? Do you put a stitch in the stab incision? No. That will take care of your bleeding too. Well, so the, the, few, the one time, one of the worst nose bleeds I've ever had after surgery was a turbinate surgery. And it's, 
it was probably because I got, there's a, there's a blood vessel that goes to the back of the inferior turbinate. If you never have to resect the back of the inferior turbinate, you'll see it, but it comes right off the sphenopalatine. And if you pass point or go back too far with whatever device you're using, because the bleed that I got was actually with a radio frequency um, needle, but I'm sure I stabbed the artery and um, it opened up like a couple days later and she had a very bad epistaxis. So um, I think that's something to be considerate of is that there's a big blood vessel back there and you want to try to avoid it. And you can get it with any instrument that you put in there. I also wouldn't promote trying to put a stitch through the head of the inferior turbinate in an awake patient in clinic. Maybe Dr. Pecker wants to do that, but Never done I'll it. pass. Told you I don't do in-office in stuff. Let, let's switch over to the uh, NOR group, the Sockies here. I want, let's hear about your guys. You, you aren't doing in-office procedures. You're taking folks to the OR. What, what's your procedures of choice? For inferior turbinate hypertrophy? Yes. I uh, reduce them. Do you want more details than that? You, you lose a point for that second question. <laughs> So these, of course, I, 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 I was going to, we want to hear what your technical, we want to hear some technical fun here. What do you so do? So I take a, I take a straight micro debrider. I use a Diego. I'm the only person in maybe the country that still uses that. And then I out fracture the, uh, turbinate and I stick the Diego on the inside of it. And I micro debrid off the entire, uh, lateral side of the turbinate. Then I take a caudal and I stick it in and I, I dissect out the bone. I take the bone out and then I fra out fracture it. And then I take the micro the tail of the of the uh, inferior turbinate, you know that mulberry tail, and I micro debride that, and then I suction bovie it, and then I'm done. Okay, Dr. Pecker. So I was going to say earlier that um, that these are really hard patients to uh, to. I think they're really hard to manage. I think I have a lot of patients that uh, have similar things like this, and um, and perhaps I'm doing it wrong, but uh, I think that when patients have a lot of inflammation like that, it can be very challenging. What I will do in the operating room, um, nine times out of 10, I just uh, do an aggressive out fracture. And uh, uh, what I worry about a lot with, uh, with uh, Removing tissue is uh, an empty nose syndrome, and uh, thank God I've never had that for one of my patients, but I've seen a lot of patients with that, and, and uh, for a while I was the liaison for the American Rhinologic Society uh, uh, and the empty nose forum, uh, and... Uh, it, that sounds like a really fun forum. Oh, it was awful. That sounds great. It was, uh, that was That's a party. Um, but these patients are really miserable, and no one really knows uh, exactly what causes that, and so I really am worried about that. Probably uh, more than I should be, but I still am really worried about that. So... Um, so I, I struggle with that. If I am going to do a turbinate reduction, I will do a stab incision in the he head, just like uh, Greg had said, a stab incision in the head of the inferior turbinate, elevate. Um, honestly, I think if you generate scar tissue in there, regardless of any of the, the, of the method that you use, that's all that matters. And, uh, and so I'll put a micro debrider blade in there and uh, usually do one pass. I will sew that head shut because that, uh, or the stab incision shut because that, uh, that does bleed like crazy uh, and um, it's not easy to do it's not convenient but uh, uh, but He's that's got all the time in the world yeah so uh, well and, uh, and it sounds like you're an expert on empty nose dr. P dr. Petker so I, I'd like to explore that a bit more with you <laughs> anything to share with the with the group about what they can do to avoid that seeing all these wonderful well not it's, I mean I'm joking pretty sad but you know is there anything you can do we can learn from you what we should be doing to avoid that, anything that could cause So that. I think there's a couple different things um, with that. One, and, and that's one of the reasons why I uh, like the aggressive out fracture. By aggressively out fracturing the turbinate, you are not changing the function of the turbinate at all. It still has all the tissue in there. It can still do everything that it uh, was doing before. And you are providing a little bit more space. Um, the... Uh, as far as you know, the empty nose. I know um, uh, Jai Kurnayak is uh, is doing a lot of this at uh, a lot of work with this with Stanford, and uh, and he has developed a uh, validated quality of life survey, the empty nose six or EN six, uh, and that's a great way to test these patients and see if they truly have the disease process or not. And then there are different things that uh, that he has described as far as trying to rebulk that. I think. 
you know, I don't know what the percentage is, 999 out of 1,000 times, you're going to probably going to be just fine reducing that turbinate. Um, but uh, I, again, I just, I, I worry about that, um, like I admitted before. Sure, sure, yeah. I need to. Anybody else have any tips on the panel there? Open question here about avoiding empty nose. Anyone have any yeah, other thoughts or have they seen cases that they so think, ah, oh, this is the key? <laughs> Fortunately, I haven't had a case, but have served as an expert witness um, defending surgeons on four or five cases now for empty nose syndrome. And it's, it's a humbling experience. The surgeons do what they think is the right thing for the patient, and some patients just have a bad outcome. Um, and the defense, what, what's important is, uh, you know, don't take unnecessary tissue. That's kind of, that is a recurring theme that I see. Get informed consent. Get permission to do both turbinates if you're going to do both turbinates. If you only need to do one, just do one. Don't do the other. Tell them why. So one, one case was a mucosal contact headache syndrome patient or Sluter's neurologist. So there was a large septal spur into an inferior turbinate. Uh, the surgeon did the septoplasty to correct the spur, also did a turbinate reduction uh, on the side that the spur was going into, and then for whatever reason also did a turbinate reduction on the contralateral side. The patient had no complaints of nasal congestion before, just facial nasal pain, and unfortunately complained of empty nose syndrome afterwards, and this lawsuit, that lawsuit did settle. So again, you, you can do... Did or did Did settle. Uh, they almost always settle. They... You know, it's it's a humbling thing to go through, even as an expert witness. And it changed how, I was just telling Scott Carpenter, it changed how I did inferior turbinate reductions. When I came back from Australia, I was doing the classic worm all the way, where you take the bone and everything lateral to the bone, all that tissue, and then curl in the medial tissue to make a nice, small kind of sausage of a, of a turbinate. And then I did my first expert witness case, and I'm like, ooh, you know. Maybe maybe I shouldn't be taking out so much tissue. So now I just do a submucosal resection. I think that's a much safer. Uh, it, it's not foolproof, but it's much safer to do it that way. I think uh, I remember when I first started um, operating here in Seattle, and one of my partners came in to observe me, and they were coming in to observe to see what my inferior turbinate reduction technique was because their sister needed surgery. And so, and I didn't know that. I just they came in and talked to me. <laughs> And, um, and so, uh, so they came in and they they watched me do the whole case and they asked me, you know, how do I do it? And I explained it, and they they were shocked. They said, "That's it," and I said, "That's it." And so I think that's kind of the point with inferior turbinate reduction surgery. It really is a, it's it's a reduction. It's a that's <coughs> it surgery. It's not a. A resection. It's not a big surgery. And I think uh, as far as Cassiano's pearls, um, the spring is what I worry about. Is, you know, I think out fracturing is great. And I also think every single turb needs something different. And so when I go in to do a turb reduction surgery, I'm not doing the same surgery every single time. I'm looking at what does this patient need? What does this nose need? What is, you know, how big is this turbinate? How wide is their... Um, you know, is their nasal vault? Um, and then what kind of disease do they have? Do they have massive nasal polyposis or they just have inferior turbinate, you know, reduction or inferior turbinate hypertrophy? And so I actually tailor my inferior turbinate reduction surgery to that patient. Like, does everybody need their mulberry tail uh, resected? No, so a lot of people don't have that. And so, but if you do have this giant mulberry tail, well, it's gotta go. And so, um, so each turbinate is different. And then, but I would say every inferior turbinate reduction surgery I do is more of a that's it surgery. Okay. Sanjay, okay. can I make one last comment on the finances of the in-office versus OR? And I just want to clarify, it is immensely cheaper for the patient to have an in-office turbinate reduction than go to an ASC or the OR where there's going to be huge facility fees for it. It's going to be two, you know, actually probably four to five X doing it in the, in the OR or ASC. So much. That mean, it sounds like it's different for Dr. Petker and Asta. They seem to think it's the other way around. So, but, but a you're five thousand dollar obvious. facility fee for just for a debridement. So, if you're in a hospital-based clinic, that's different, and you can have a facility fee. If you're in a normal clinic environment, you won't. You can't charge a facility fee. It's just the pro fee. That's why all these should go to Greg. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. Yeah, take them.
All right. So it's let's easy. move on. So I think we I love heard the patient. ratio here of the in-office to OR is different between the groups depending on their location. And uh, it seems like if you're in a clinic, uh, you know, in your own pr private clinic, in, in, in office is definitely demonstrates value. And also, um, let's move on. We won't support you. Any, I'm sorry? The, the other part of it is, too, is my hospital won't support me to do that. You know, like they... Okay. So. Okay. Gotcha. Okay. Let's uh, let's move on to another case. Any other... I, I can't hear everybody. So is any other comments or questions, Greg, from the audience there before we move on? What do you do for the uh, compensatory the question is, what do you do for compensatory hypertrophy of the inferior turbine? So you have a septal septum that's deviated to one side. There's always going to be compensatory hypertrophy. If you don't address that compensatory hypertrophy, when you correct the septum, they're going to breathe horribly on the what used to be their good side. So I always, in that case, always do a turbinate reduction for the compensatory hypertrophy. And my goal is to try to make the turbinates symmetric. And if I have to do a little bit on the other side, um, I'll do a little bit. If I don't, then I won't. Agree. Okay. Question. Okay. Should we move on then? Is that okay? Sounds good. Okay. So the next one is uh, now we're let's move on to CRS with polyposis. So this is a 50 year old uh, with CRS with polyposis. Pr three previous full house ESS procedures. So having had full endoscopic sinus surgery with removal of polyposis out and out another 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 place and they've sent to you uh, for an additional evaluation uh, the uh, the major symptom is obstruction not not facial pain uh, but obstruction is uh, the main symptom and intranasal endoscopy reveals diffuse polyposis both sides front to back uh, really bad uh, so we'll start off with sort of what's your paradigm? Uh, of treatment for a patient, and this patient may, I would say, has not been worked up is, uh, adequately. That's what I would say. Um, and what's your paradigm for symptomatic refractory nasal polyposis? Uh, yeah, it's a big, it's a big question. We'll start with Team uh, Saki here, Dr. Anstead, Dr. Petker. What do you guys think about about this scenario? So, um, if they haven't been worked up properly, then I would. Um have them see sure. uh, one of my yeah, allergy colleagues and uh, and see what uh, uh, what they're allergic to if if something like a uh, uh, immunotherapy would be a, a good option I have found in my experience that uh, relatively few people pursue immunotherapy due to the time uh, intensity therapy and the cost um, the uh, and if they've not been on uh, the topical topical medications, like we had talked before, I think um, that uh, that's a good option. Um, the uh, I, I have been uh, people who you think topical therapy will work on a patient with massive nasal polyposis after three endoscopic procedures. Do I think it'll work? It depends on the individual. So um, I have seen it work. Um, do they need it? I think some of it has to do with um, the procedures that they have had done and uh, the full house fesses and, and who did those full house fesses. Do they still have their middle turbinates? Um, uh, were those resected? Have they had uh, any kind of extended procedures like a sphenoid drill out or a, a, a medial maxillectomy? Have they had a, a draft three uh, or low throat procedure done? That will, um, uh, will impact my decision making there but a lot of it has to do like Doug had said what's their quality of life and, and what bothers them and uh, not everybody wants um, the same thing and so uh, so you, you have to find out what they want what they've been on if they you can make them better enough with a topical therapy that might be all you need um, and then uh, I, I think uh, I'm sure one of the questions will get to this a little bit later, but I think the biologics hold a tremendous promise. Uh, let's go to the uh, Saltimores. I think there's a couple things I would do, certainly before thinking about biologics. Uh, and just briefly, I agree with the workup on allergy. I, all my polyp patients, I also get an IgE and a CBC with diff. I want to know what their eosinophil level is. That's going to help predict what their future holds. If they have a systemic inflammatory problem, they're going to have a problem for a long time. And it's nice to uh, counsel the patient about that and start thinking about a biologic. 
However, the three full house fesses is, is different depending on the surgeon and depending on the patient. So with that, I'm gonna to wanna to know what the CT scan shows. Are there a lot of septations left behind or do we have a nice lamina to middle turbinate, skull base to inferiorly all cleaned out and it's just polyp recurrence. That very much changes what I do. If they have had incomplete full house fesses, which happens, then they need a full house fess, a true full house fess, open floor plan so that the topical therapies can work. If they have had a complete full house fest, and it's just polyp recurrence, these are fantastic patients for in-office polypectomy, and then consider something like Sinuva, the three-month bometazone implant, or something like Exhance, or just bedesonide irrigations, and that's what I would do as a first-round therapy for that. I, the one thing I would add is, um, how long ago was that last full house fest? You know, if that was 15 years ago, well, that's a pretty good response, but, um, but if it was five months ago, then um, an in-office polypectomy is going to last them another couple months, and that's about it. So then I would bump up to something different. You also have to ask them about asthma and whether they have a sensitivity to aspirin. So if they mm -hmm. haven't been desensitized, that could also improve their outcome. I think that's a really good point. Uh, the uh, AERD patients can sometimes present a little bit later if you haven't thought about it. Um, let, let's just say this in this case, the you know patient was done by Dr. Kennedy about a year ago, and so you know you you, you it pretty pretty well done sort of sinus uh, case, uh, you know, full Probably house, all, the, all everything's gone. Is in office polypectomy the next step? If you you know after you you've established the other you know let's say it's this patient's got bad allergies, doesn't want to have immunotherapy, wants to just feel better, you know, is in office an option for this type of polyposis, or are the risks too high? I mean, you're alluding to the fact that he had surgery by David Kennedy, so he had a complete surgery. So, yeah, I, I agree with Greg. Maybe. I don't know him that well, but I'm thinking. Well, I mean, he's a good surgeon. So, yeah. you know, you're, you're saying he's had a complete surgery. So yeah. there's no partitions. There's no bony work to be done. In-office polypectomy works great for these patients. And their chief complaint, their major symptom what is what you're saying is obstruction. So take out, debris the polyps in the office, they're going to feel great. What do you think, uh, Dr. Ray, about bleeding risks in these type of patients? Have you had any challenges with that, with polyposis uh, in, in office? Sanjay, one of our um, um, participants asked about um, why not try oral steroids. 100%. If they haven't been on oral steroids for yeah. a year, two years, yeah. And we all see those patients that are incredibly steroid responsive, right? So you treat them with oral steroids and they feel great. And if they need oral steroids once a year, but you're saving them from a procedure, that, that's, a, that's a fine way to treat those patients. About twice. Twice, okay. What about Sanuva? Yeah. Um, yeah, we mentioned that. What about a CF Usually you see infection as well. I mean, a CF patient has a very specific look to them. If it's if it's just straight up polyps, not thick, um, like infection, I mean, they usually have pseudomonas or they can get MRSA. Um, so you're, you're looking at a clean but uh, cavity with polyps. I think more CRS with polyps. If you see sort of a lot of debris with infection um, that's kind of sticking to everywhere, then yeah, you, a CF workup is totally reasonable. And that goes along with what Doug had said about the asthma also. And so um, if, they, if uh, they do have lung issues, well then you send them to the pulmonologist and, and, uh, uh, and then you know, we work pretty closely with our pulmonologists. I think CF is always on their differential. So, uh, so they think about that. I think you're making, let me ask the four of you this uh, question. Is, is, have we gotten to a point where anyone with CRS with polyposis is now multidisciplinary care? Is, do you think, you know, is that, is that what you, because that's what I've been thinking recently, is this is no longer, because uh, most of the patients I see are CF or AERD, um, and, um, and I realize that I can't do this alone. I need help. So I want to hear what you guys think. Is, it, is this now a multidisciplinary type of problem? I think the vast majority of patients with, um, that need three revision surgeries are multidisciplinary um, you know, candidates. So 
Um, I, I think I have like a 12 page packet that patients have to fill out and they have, they're asking, I'm asking everything from their allergy history, their pulmonary history, their even GI history. So um, you have to look at these, their, the whole patient, not just um, their polyp. If a patient has asthma, they need to have an asthma doctor. That's easy. If they don't have asthma and they just have polyps, then we can take care of them, especially if you're doing otolaryngic allergy. You know, we can do depiction mm -hmm. if you That's need to. That's a good to. point. Uh, we can control their allergies. But to your point, Sanjay, to your question, if they have asthma or any pulmonary disease, that's, that's the, uh, the, the cue for me to send them off for multidisciplinary care. So we, we have had a, uh, uh, a multidisciplinary clinic, um, Vanderbilt uh, um, has had one for years with the allergists and the, uh, and the otolaryngologists and, and pulmonologists. And we have a clinic that was called Open Airs, and the Airs was allergy, immunology, rhinology, and sleep. And so anybody with nasal symptoms would come into that. The, the hard part that we had was buy-in from our allergists and, uh, and some of the pulmonologists for that. And so I, I absolutely agree. I think uh, multidisciplinary clinics are crucial. Um, you know, I know at Penn they have a, uh, uh, an allergist that uh, is in the rhinology clinic uh, and is a member of the rhinology division and sees patients with uh, the, the Penn guys. And so whether you're a medical immunologist or an otolaryng uh, otolaryngic allergist, I think I think that that's uh, uh, really important and having a good relationship with your pulmonologist I think is really important too. So I think you're going to see more and more of that multidisciplinary care like you had mentioned, uh, Sanjay. Yeah. I'm and I think you guys have highlighted something that I'm not thinking about is in, in the pediatric care, we don't have any otolaryngologists that are sort of dual allergy and oto that are hospital based. There are some out there. So you're making me think too about that is maybe you don't need multi. If you have a good partner and it's, you know, and an allergy or you yourself are, you, there's obviously you have competency in that. Sorry, I interrupted you, Greg. You had another comment? Uh, it's the same thing. I, I totally agree with you, Sanjay, for bonus points. Thank you. <laughs> you get one. Thank you. Uh, no, but it, we are the allergists. You know, it, how many of you guys do allergy in your practice? So it's uh, about a third, Sanjay, to a quarter. Um, Doug and I do. Yeah. Do you do it? Yeah. We have an allergist. Yeah. So whether or not you have an allergist or you are the allergist, think of it, that is a multidisciplinary approach. But again, there's no reason that, that an otolaryngologist can't do fantastic allergy care. But before we, had an, before we had an allergist, we did our own allergy. I mean, so these multi-D clinics are great in an academic setting, but none of us are going to have a multi-D clinic if we're in private practice. So uh, load the boat. I mean, if they have asthma, they need to have a pulmonologist or an allergist that can manage that because both can do it. If you're worried about immune dysfunction or other things, then you have them see a rheumatologist. But but, but definitely, if, if they're just straight, Greg kind of whispered to me, if they, if they have straight up polyps and no asthma and no other history and they're just stuffy, then treat them with oral steroids. If that doesn't work, take the polyps out in the office. It's not rocket science. Cool. Now, um, I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going to just guess all of you do the same thing. You know, you, you offer surgery, last resort. And then I don't know about you, but for me, patients with polyps, I, I, it's a, it's a long-term long relationship. I don't think I've cured anybody with, with nasal polyps. Have, you, have, have, you, have any of you cured anyone with nasal polyps? Sanjay, I'm sure you've cured people. They just get better and they don't come back. That's true. <laughs> or they get older than 21 you know, and, and, and it, goes, it goes in kids, it know. goes in waves. You know, some some months you like, yeah, I got this disease, you know, and everyone's doing good. And then all of a sudden it's like a flood of people, all the polyps are coming back. Maybe it's allergy related, but it, it, it's a very humbling thing. This the expectations is key, and that is one reason why I like to get the IgE and the eosinophil level. So I have expectations too. Um, I think if you plant the seed that medical therapy is a key to success after successful sinus surgery, then patients will understand. If you, you know, the old days, 10, 15 years ago, we used to think surgery would cure polyps. But if you tell the patients or ask them, you know, what's the surgical cure for asthma, right? And they're like, oh, there isn't a surgery for asthma, right? And you're like, yeah, it's the same disease. There's no surgical cure for inflammatory sinus disease. It just allows the topical therapies to work. So using that asthma, analogy for me has been helpful for patients. Surgical cure for asthma is good sinus surgery followed by maximum medical management. <laughs>
Yeah, but I think Greg brings up a really good point for all of you, which is manage your patient's expectations. So set the bar really low, and it's easy to, to, to exceed those expectations. So I have this conversation with all my polyp patients when I meet them for the first time because a lot of them are coming from other surgeons. They're like, Dr. So-and-so you know, did surgery on me, and now I'm, they, I felt good for two months, and now I'm back, and they did a terrible job. And I say, well, Dr. So-and-so did fine surgery on you. They just didn't explain to you the disease. So you need to set the expectation that your goal is for them to feel better, but they're never going to feel normal. And right, a lot of these patients used to feel normal, and then they develop their disease, and they don't feel normal anymore, and they're upset about it. But if you have a real heart-to-heart -heart conversation with these patients and explain to them that a lot of them have asthma, and they have a lot of symptoms, and the quality of life scores for these patients are very low. They can't go to work. They feel terrible. And so you, you're, you're, you shouldn't tell them that they're going to feel great after your surgery and that they're going to be normal again. You should tell them you're going to try to get them to feel a little bit better so they can go to work, and maybe their smell will come back. Maybe it won't. Hopefully, they'll sleep better. And so, usually, you can exceed that bar, and then they're going to think you're a genius. The problem that I have isn't so much that they don't feel great after surgery. They feel fantastic after surgery. Surgery, but they feel so good they stop using their medications. That's the problem. So I, don't, I would never tell a patient, hey, you're never going to feel normal again. I think that's a terrible thing to tell a patient. I would tell them that, yeah, we can make you feel better, but this is a medical managed, uh, uh, medically managed disease. And so, you know, um, it's uh, you guys in private practice, you all uh, just tell them they are going to feel terrible so you can do in-office uh, polypectomies every three months and make more money. So, so I guess what I would argue what I would By the way, that was, is, so, that was so offensive. You get two points for that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. He, get, he should get five so points for that. What I would say to that is... He's been giving me a hard time about academics all weekend or all week. <laughs> so what I would it say is beautiful. I'm setting the bar low so you can exceed it, but I'm also setting the bar low and setting their expectations so they'll take their medicine. Because the second part of that conversation is I do tell them that if I told you you had diabetes right now and you need to take your insulin to have a long and happy life, they take their insulin. So I tell them I could do the best surgery in the world, but if they don't take their medical therapy afterwards, they're never going to feel great. So part of setting the bar low is to scare them enough so that they do take their, their medicine. But but it's I should human have, nature. I, I should have been feel complete. Well, they don't do their meds. Right. It's so I should have, nature. to be complete, I do, part of my conversation with them is you need to take your medicine, otherwise the surgery is not going to work. Yeah. And I, Dr. I Dr. Einstein, what do you think? Just what, one last comment, then I want to move on. Dr. Anstead, you had one more comment, then we'll move on. You're going to give me a moment. So I, I, the other thing I would say, though, is that in these patients, because this disease is so horrible, um, a lot of these patients have anxiety and depression. And so I think it is important to give them a little bit of hope. Um, especially if you think that you're going to be able to help them. You should. You can tell them, I, I think I can help you, but I would get, and I actually give them in writing after I explain to them that this is a chronic disease, um, and, and also talk about that this is going to be a long-term relationship, that I'm not going to just operate on you and you're cured and see you later. Um, and so I think, I, I think he's making a very good point that um, you need to have a heart-to-heart -heart with the patient that, yes, we can make you better, but, but that, um, that, no th that this Stop is going to be a long-term relationship. No I just told me something. Okay. Uh, yeah, they, they, they're, this is, this is, all right, Amy, I like that comment. You know, it's funny because it's, it's this fine line, isn't it, that we're, we want to set the bar low, but we want to offer hope at the same time, right? I really, it's a, it's a little balance there. Greg, I have a question for you. It's, it's, uh, it's. I think our time's officially up. But is the is the audience had enough drinks that they want to keep going, or do they want to uh, sort of wind things down? They're done with us. I don't know. Do you guys want to do one more case? Uh, I don't know. Just push buttons. Happy. Yeah, so getting back to the patient that had the uh, inferior turban and hypertrophy with the mulberry turban, it's, um, you know, I've done tonsillectomies and seen kids with these great big bulbous turbinates and take the suction cautery back there and cook those down a little bit to help them breathe better. And one of the pediatric otolaryngologists that taught me said that <clears throat> once, you, um, once you take the adenoid out and get their airway better, that inferior turban and hypertrophy will get better. And then he said it's just like the patients who have tracheotomies, when they're not breathing through their nose, their nose swells on the inside. So my question going all the way back to that was, is could them inferior turbine hypertrophy people, the etiology be that they're mouth breathers? That's my question for the panel. That's interesting. Mm -hmm. 
you want. Sure, that makes perfect sense. Why I mean, everything you said is exactly, I mean, laryngectomy patients, right? They all have really stuffy looking noses. It's a good point. Sanjay, I think, uh, is there, do you want to just cover like the pearl for your last case? I think we're, we've reached a good point to wrap it up for the evening. Okay. Um, I think um, I'll ask just one last question, and it's more of a surgical question because there's so much. We are going to cover this right topic. Is, We're going to cover middle is, turbinate uh, tomorrow, just so you know. Pardon me. We're going to cover middle turbinate tomorrow. Okay, then let's uh, let's do let's wrap up. Let's wrap up. We're the best. Okay. Plus one to you. I, I wanted. I want, I've been. I, well, I'm excited to share Six the story. I, I'm sure that before we, before we part ways, Dr. Mulligan has a question. Comment. We're going to talk about osteomas tomorrow. Yep. 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 You got. That's the teaser. Yes, sir. Oh, in the consent form for surgery for nasal polyps, do I have written down that the polyps will come back? I have it written down. Need for additional surgery, um, and I always verbally tell them the, the polyps. You know, will eventually come back unless you, you know, even if we do aggressive medical therapy. Yeah, I don't think you have to have it written down, but I do think additional surgery is a smart thing to have for any surgery because that will cover scar tissue formation or recurrent polyps. Sanjay, any parting thoughts? Yes. Um, I, I, I'm so grateful and humbled to be a part of this uh, panel. I, I think uh, Dr. An Dr. Zanstead, Petker, Ray, Davis, you guys are just exceptional and it was real. Real fun. Um, unfortunately, we had to disclose. We did have to disclose a winner. There's a surprise winner, though. There's a third team that emerged uh, out of the four of you, and the the winning team is doctors uh, Ray and Petker. Actually, so it's a, it's a surprising. It's a surprise finish. But anyone who's willing to travel to Seattle in this climate to come and to, for the purpose of for the purpose of teaching, they deserve the prize. So the two of you guys get a prize. Thing, and that's my gracious. Well, thanks Thank very you. much. Sanjay, thank you for joining us. Sorry you couldn't be here in person, but really appreciate you taking the time out of your day uh, to have fun with us. Cheers. Thank you.